Please stand. Let us pray. Let our, in, let our prayers rise before you as incense, O God and let your loving kindness descend upon us 
that with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, we may sing your praises through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us pray. Holy and mighty God, your Son's triumph over sin and death has opened forever the gate of eternal life. Save us, we pray, when we are in distress, pressed to the point of falling. Let the joy of your salvation resound through your church and in our lives, and let the whole creation reflect the brilliant light of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from the first letter of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, this mortal body puts on immortality then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Good evening and welcome to Bach Vespers at Holy Trinity. My name is Tim Wiseman and I serve as pastor of this congregation. And please know whether you've been here a thousand times or tonight happens to be your first time experiencing this music in this place, whether in person or online, there will always be a place for you here. In the summer of 325, that is around 1700 years ago, an infamous Roman emperor by the name of Constantine called all 1800 bishops in his Rolodex and gave them a month to get thyself to a city named Nicaea in what is now northern Turkey. Spoiler alert, only about 300 of them actually showed up. Now, some of you already know where I'm going with this, so help me out. Because arguably the only reason a whopping 17% of all bishops met in the summer of 325 was to write of all things something called a creed. And not just any creed, but a concise, scripturally sound, theologically orthodox, and most importantly, heresy-free statement of belief that would end all theological controversy forever. Well, y'all know there ain't no fight like a church fight, and these bishops do not disappoint. They only get 48 words into their miracle creed before a literal fist fight breaks out over whether Jesus is begotten by God, that is, whether Jesus is the exact same substance as God, homoousion in Greek, or whether Jesus is created by God, that is, made from a similar substance as God, homoousion in Greek. Homoousion, same. Homoousion, similar. Two words that only differ by a single letter in the Greek alphabet. 
Which means if you do the math and carry the one, arguably the most heated debate in all of church history comes down to an iota, or iota if you prefer. And while admit it makes for a great story, it's really hard to exaggerate the extent to which these fourth century bishops felt like they just had to get this right. It as much as their creed ought express exactly who Jesus Christ is. Which is all to say that I find it deeply ironic that after some 300 bishops spent three months working out the precise theological mechanism by which divine and human nature could exist together in one undivided person, that is, after some 300 bishops spent three months clutching their pearls over exactly who Jesus Christ is, when we turn to the next sentence, which was supposed to be about, you know, what Jesus Christ actually does, all we get is a whopping four words in Greek and five in English. He was crucified for us. Hang with me for another minute because I've almost got to where I'm going. For a creed intending to be a concise, scripturally sound, theologically orthodox, and most importantly, heresy-free statement of belief that would end all theological controversy forever, those five words, he was crucified for us, sure do leave a lot to the imagination with respect to what it means when Jesus died for us. Nevertheless, for 700 years, for 700 years, the medieval church was quite content with the mystery that a little theological ambiguity can afford. That is, until a guy named Anselm comes along, 300 years before the Reformation, and decides that those four Greek words mean something incredibly specific. But as Anselm decides that when those pearl-clutching, long-dead bishops wrote for us, they didn't intend an ambiguous for our benefit or, I don't know, for our redemption, but rather Anselm believed that what they really meant to write is that when Jesus Christ died for us, they meant that Jesus Christ died in our place. Though more specifically, God killed Jesus as a scapegoat for all our sins. God forgive me for all my manifold sins, which are about to include actually using this phrase in a sermon, but it's called penal substitutionary atonement. And what was considered a pretty wacky idea at the time would have and should have been relegated to the dustbin of bad theology, if not for a budding young 16th century reformer by the name of Martin Luther, who believed God's justice and wrath required punishment. But thanks be to God, or so he says, that God begat Jesus so God could punish him on a cross instead. Which is all to say that it ought not be surprising that there is a whole lot of penal substitutionary atonement in the cantata you're about to hear, especially since the libretto is all seven stanzas from the 16th century Easter hymn, Christ Log and Totus Banden, a hymn that was written by none other than Martin Luther himself. Jesus Christ, on unser Stadt ist er kommen, has come in our stead. Für unser Asunt gegeben, handed over for our sins. God hat geboten, God has commanded das Osterlamm in heißer Lieb gebraten, the Easter lamb, roasted mm. in burning love. 
which at best means that the sacrificial death of an itinerant Jewish teacher on a Friday afternoon somehow did satisfy God's blazing hot wrath, or at worst means that not only did God make a deal with the devil, but that God negotiates with terrorists. Here's the thing. It took literally hundreds of years for a card-carrying Lutheran to propose another way of understanding Jesus' death on a cross. And interestingly enough, the first one to famously do so just happened to be the same age as the young whippersnapper organist in Mühlhausen named Johann Sebastian Bach. And while it's important for me to get these things right, that is, it's important for, to note that Johann Sebastian Bach was an extraordinarily orthodox Lutheran theologian named musician. I'd also like to think that Herr Bach, always the avid reader, actually did read around. That is, I'd like to think that Johann Sebastian Bach was at least intrigued by the thought that not only is penal substitutionary atonement an incomplete witness to the gospel, but that it's also just too simplistic. After all, the entire Lutheran tradition is built upon mystery and paradox. That God is both hidden and revealed. That Jesus Christ is both human and divine. That each of us is both sinner and justified. That the bread we break and the cup we bless is both the body and blood of Christ and actual bread and wine. And that the baptism we receive both extinguishes sin and ignites a fire. So why in the world would we be satisfied with such an easy theology as God handing Jesus over to the devil only for Satan to accept the ransom, so let's go eat some ham? Which is all to say that where Martin Luther's 16th century hymn, what with its insistence on penal substitutionary atonement, isn't exactly theologically elaborate. Johann Sebastian Bach makes it elaborate. Whereas Luther's hymn flirts with monotony with its oft-repeated tropes, Bach makes this cantata anything but monotonous. Even though congregations in Mühlhausen and Leipzig knew this particular hymn like the back of their metaphorical hands, Bach manages to throw in plenty of surprises. After all, box setting of this old chestnut in all its complexity with the battle between Christ and the devil so dramatically and zealously portrayed makes it clear that Bach isn't just going through the motions. He's doing theology. Because even though I'm an unsurprisingly and unabashedly card-carrying Lutheran, it is nevertheless a betrayal of the tradition to treat a 500-year-old version of 800-year-old theology as a fait accompli. It is a betrayal of the tradition to assume that just because Martin Luther argued that God required the death of Jesus in order to be merciful, that we ought uncritically accept that as gospel truth, especially when the idea of God being placated by the death of God's only begotten Son Sure sounds like anything, but good news. But what I do know, down to my bones, is that Jesus of Nazareth preached compassion and forgiveness, abundance and mercy, acceptance and love, and humanity promptly killed him for it. Yet God did not intervene so that God's people need not fear death ever again. The spe specific mechanism of which is the one word you may have noticed that I've been avoiding. Which is to say that our Easter hope ought not come through Christ's death, but through Christ's resurrection. I may not know why Jesus Christ died, 
but I sure do know why he was raised. And on this much, Anselm, Luther, Bach, 17% of 4th century bishops, and I, can certainly agree. Jesus Christ was raised because life is stronger than death. Jesus Christ was raised because life cannot be conquered by death. Jesus Christ was raised because God does not negotiate with terrorists. And that's precisely where this cantata blossoms, as it were. In those particular moments when both Luther and Bach celebrate Jesus Christ's victory over sin and death and its significance for our own salvation. And while I'll never understand why that theology never made it into the Nicene Creed, I guess I'll have to take that up with the bishops. In the meantime, because Christ lives, we shall live also. And on that point, I'm just not going to budge. Not one iota. Happy Easter. And all God's people said, Amen.
Good evening and happy Easter. I'm Tom Barrett. I'm the Congregational Council President at Holy Trinity. And I wanted to take a minute to welcome all of you and say thank you to our guest conductor, Dr. Ryan Brando, and our outstanding vocalists and musicians who brought tonight's cantata to life. Thank you to Pastor Tim Wiseman, to our organist, Austin Philemon, and our artistic administrators, Robbie Meese and Ellie Perry, who are all the daily stewards of Bach Vespers. And a special thank you to our volunteers from Holy Trinity, who will host our reception shortly at the back of the church. Ten years ago, when I first moved to New York City, I started to volunteer with Bach Vespers, helping with publicity outreach. As you can see, Bach Vespers is very much a community effort. If Holy Trinity is to offer these kinds of musical experiences to the people of New York City, both live and online, it can't happen without the help of all types of volunteers and your financial support. While tonight is an important moment in our 56th season, it's not the final Bach Vespers of spring 2024. There's still more to come. We'll be back on Sunday, April 28th at 5 p.m. with Dr. Gwen Toth conducting BWV 165. And we have a special Saturday event. On Saturday, May 18th at 7 p.m., Bach Vespers presents works for Double Chorus and BWV 225, led by Dr. David Chin, who is the artistic director of Bach Fest Malaysia. I'm told this will be an extraordinary festival of psalms with a German title that I can't pronounce, <laughs> but big works based on the psalms, and it promises to be a grand finale to the season, so please mark your calendars. We'd love to see you there. Thank you again for your generous support and your presence here this evening.
Let us pray. Almighty God, the Father, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened the gate of everlasting life to us. Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of our Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, grant that we may be numbered among those chosen by God to be witnesses of your resurrection, not only by word of mouth, but in actions and truth, for your honor and glory. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign as one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O eternal God, let your love for us burn within you, so we may be the same members of your Son's body that you first made us to be in your love when you begot your Son at the dawn of time before creation was yet made. Look on whatever troubles may befall us. Take them from us for the sake of your Son and lead us to the joy of your salvation. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. Amen.